In Christ Church, good morning. God bless you in this day that we gather in the house of the Lord. I'm excited uh, that, that you are here. I'm excited, brother or sister uh, joining us online, that, that you are here. Uh, church, I'm even more thrilled to, to see that there were some this morning that were so excited to receive God's word that they came an hour early. They just could not wait. Now, for, for those of you who, uh, who showed up early uh, to your to your computer monitor or to your iPad screen or your phone or however you're joining us by whatever device uh, who are joining us a, a, an hour early. I, I trust that it's your excitement for worship this morning and not that you forgot that you needed to set your clock uh, an hour back. But either way, either way, we are delighted that you're with us this morning. My name is Jake Steele. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, I'm the pastor of Christ United Methodist Church. And, and as pastor of this church, we make a practice of saying, uh, no matter who you are or where you're from or how you got here, what it is that's got you, in the name of Christ Jesus, indeed, you are welcome in this place. So if you're a brand new face or if you're a, a, a visitor joining us here or online this morning, uh, we are delighted, we are excited and thrilled that you've chosen Christ Church as your place uh, of worship. And I know you can't see many of us on this All Saints Sunday, uh, the day after we celebrate All Hallows Eve. Uh, you can't see many of us if you're joining us from a computer screen. And, and so our means of welcoming you, uh, first what I'd like to do is for you to look to your left or to your right or to, to see your neighbors across the aisle. And, and rather than to stand up and shake their hand, which we can't do, I want you to extend a hand and say hello real quick. Real, real quick. Yeah, and, and for those of you who can't see those of us, I, I'm not here with a few folks. I'm not pretending there's a congregation here. So by a round of applause, I want you to greet our neighbors and brothers and sisters joining us online. One, two, three, go. <laughs> We're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, to, make, to make room for the space that I think needs to happen uh, for our celebration of Holy Communion that we'll celebrate in uh, just a while. Uh, we're we're going to jump right into things this morning. Last week, and you, you can recall that, that we spent some time in, in the book of Deuteronomy uh, chronicling the journey of, of Moses and the people from the Exodus in Egypt to being on the brink of the promise. And, and, and last week, we examined the text that, that saw Moses go up to the top of Mount Pisgah, and there it was, God, it was God who showed him the expanse of land that God was going to promise the people and, and their ancestors, uh, the, 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 that God promised for, uh, for spans of time to that point. And it was there that Moses realized that the blessing wasn't going to come to him. It was going to come through him. That, that, that in the midst of the expanse, in, in the midst of the expanse that separated Moses from where he was to where he wanted to be, God gave him a glimpse and it was good enough. And, and, we, and we learned, we discovered last week how it is that, that God gives us grace for the gaps. That the things we oftentimes work on or wrestle with is a means whereby somebody else can walk through. And we're continuing that. Uh, this morning. We're seeing how it is that the legacy that Moses left carried on through a different people, that, that Moses positioned them to experience something that they had never, ever experienced before. And, and we find ourselves in that same legacy, that same line of, uh, of faith. And, and so uh, I want to create a space where we can receive God's word this morning. And I don't know how, how you're coming to church this morning. I know, I know the mediums that you're using, either in person or uh, digital. Uh, some of you might be tuning in live in this broadcast as we speak. Uh, some of you may be tuning in at the 11 o'clock hour or uh, the, uh, the, the 7 o'clock hour. Uh, soon, we're going to have the capacity to, to view this service at any point in the day after we worship live. Uh, but no matter how you're joining us, if it's on Facebook uh, through a, a recorded service through the week, uh, we hope that this message blesses you. I hope that it blesses you in the way that it's blessed me in, in our examining it, my examining it this week. But, but for the sake of clarity, I want to bring you, we've left Deuteronomy and we've entered into the book of Joshua. And I, and I want to bring you to the third chapter of Joshua. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be reading from the message 
paraphrase. It's not so much a translation in as much as it's a paraphrase, but I think it speaks powerfully to us this morning. Joshua 3, verses 7 to 17. Hear these words. God said to Joshua, this very day, I will begin to make you great in the eyes of all Israel. And I have to pause there because there's a phrase in that passage that struck me. Because lest we think that the movement of God help happens in one fell swoop, the fact that God tells Joshua this very day, I'll begin to make you, tells us or at least leads us to perceive that the work of God in our lives happens somewhat gradually. That God said, I'll begin to make you great in the eyes of all Israel. My my, my walk with you is a process, and there are things that you discover as you walk faithfully. I'm going to begin to make you. I'm not going to make you great right now, but but, 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 but it's significant that, that I'm going to start to. I'm going to begin to make you great in the eyes of all Israel. The process also continues with us. The work of salvation isn't a one and done deal. It doesn't have to do with the prayer that you, uh, prayer that you prayed a long time ago to say, Jesus, enter into my heart, uh, get me into heaven. But salvation is a process where we get a little bit of a heaven into us as we sojourn this life here. But God said to Joshua, this day I'll make you, I'll begin to make you great in the eyes of all Israel. And they'll see for themselves that I'm with you in the same way that I was with Moses. And then Scripture goes on to say that you'll command the priests who are carrying the chest of the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, this. When when you come to the edge of the Jordan's waters, stand there on the riverbank. And then Joshua, in obedience to what God told him, addressed the people of Israel. Attention, listen up, people. Listen up, brothers and sisters. Listen to what God, your God, has to say. This is how you'll know that God is alive among you because they weren't sure the death of Moses. This is how you're going to know. God's going to completely dispossess before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. I had a week to practice all those names. I got them. Look, look at what's crossing. Look at what's before you. The, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the, the very outward representation of the presence of God. Think of it. The master of the entire earth is crossing the Jordan as you watch. Now, because of that, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from each tribe. And when the soles of the feet of the priest carrying the chest of God, master of all the earth, touch the Jordan's water, the flow of water will be stopped. The, the water coming from upstream will pile up in a heap. And, and that's what happened. The, the people left their tents to cross the Jordan, led by the priest carrying the chest of the covenant. And when the priest got to the Jordan, Scripture says, and their feet touched the water at the edge, and by the way, the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest, more on that in a little bit. The water of the flow of water stopped, Scripture says. The flow of water stopped. It piled up in a heap a long way off at Adam, which is near Zarethan. The river went, went dry all the way down to the Arabah Sea, the, the Salt Sea, and the people crossed facing Jericho. And there they stood, those priests carrying the chest of the covenant, stood firmly, planted on dry ground, in the middle of the Jordan, while all of Israel crossed on dry ground. Finally, the whole nation was across the Jordan in not one wet foot. That's where we stopped this morning. Uh, if you're a living, rich, real, and relevant word of God, for a living people of God, and all of those of us say, thanks be to God. I, I, I want to I offer for my subject this morning, something significant. It's a continuation of last week. Not not just grace for the gaps that we face now, but grace for the gaps again. Grace for the gaps again. Let us pray. Holy God, have your way in this place. Move among us and in us and through us as a people who seek to follow in your way in a most powerful way, Lord. Convict us Change us, 
challenge us, but most importantly, transform us into the kinds of people who find ourselves in this space, in this house of God, or in another house of God, our own homes, understanding that this is the day that the Lord has made in less than favorable times socially and spiritually and emotionally and mentally and politically and racially, however we might slice it, we understand this is the day that you've created and we seek to stand in it faithfully as your people, knowing that you've called us to be ambassadors of a gospel that is greater than any kind of news that we might receive through media outlets. It is a good news, Lord, that transforms us, starting with us and the rest of the world. We ask that you help us to be harbingers, vehicles to this word is actively lived out. Feed us, therefore. Fill us and free us to live this word out fully. As your people, we give you thanks ahead of time for what you're doing and about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. So we learned that the people were in process, did we not? And we, and we talked last week about the problems process pose for us. They were between their past, where they were, and where they wanted to be, the promise. And, and it's hard to be caught in process between what you knew and where you want to be. It's hard to be caught in the place, spiritually and emotionally, in process between your past and and God's future promise. And if you spend enough time in process, you, you can start to lose hope in any kind of promise that God offers. And, and that's where the people were, brothers and sisters. You ever been in process? Are you in process now? Emotionally? Spiritually, mentally? Maybe professionally? You talk to many people who are between. Uh, in the middle of something. I have conversations with people who were somewhat between jobs and not knowing where the next portion of provision is going to come from. But the people were, were in process and they were moving toward a promise. And just when they thought they were going to get there, they had realized that Moses had died and they weren't sure that the presence of God was going to go with them since the leader had passed. But God's promise and God's provision was still steadfast and sure. But alas, they, they were so close to crossing into the promise, but they were in process and encountered a problem. That, that, that generation of people were, were in the middle of something they, they never imagined because just as they were getting ready to cross into the promise, there was another obstacle, uh, 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 another, another problem. They, they, they saw the water's current. A, another body of water. They, they, they saw the water's current and it concerned them be, be, because it was so crazy. The, the water's banks flood during the harvest. They, they, they saw the current and the current was crazy and because of the conditions, they weren't sure that they could cross. And again, this is, some, this is a word that God spoke to me this morning, and I adjusted the introduction of my sermon to give you this because I think it's something that the Lord wants us to hear. They, they saw the water's current, and it concerned them. And because of the conditions, they weren't sure they could ever cross. And I want to use that as a springboard, as a canvas, to say that isn't it easy to lose confidence in a hopeful tomorrow because of a current? Isn't it easy to, to, to lose confidence that tomorrow could be hopeful because of today's current? Because all you see is a current, is the current. And because of the current, not a body of water, not a flow of water, but where we are currently, it's easy to lose confidence of a brighter tomorrow. But God says, don't fix your eyes on what you see or experience currently. The current is crazy, we could say. The current is crazy, but your eyes shouldn't be fixed wholly and solely on the current. It's not the word to be ignorant or overlook the, the, the craziness of the current, but, 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 but not to lose confidence in your ability to cross because there's a greater promise that you can't yet see in experience, but it's coming nonetheless. They were between where they were and where 
they wanted to be. They were, they were in what seemed to be an unprecedented place. They were in the middle of something they could have never imagined. And even though they were in a place that seemed unprecedented, it wasn't unprecedented to God. It may have been unprecedented for the people, and we might find ourselves in a current that seems unprecedented, but it's not unprecedented to God. And it's not surprising to others who have stuck around long enough to see how it is that God's work through time. You see, I, I can't help but to think that, that at some point before they had the faith to cross and they set foot in the water, they had conversation. Doesn't this seem, doesn't this seem somewhat similar? Did you not engage the text in Joshua and not hearken back to an early phase of the history of the people? Doesn't, doesn't what we read in Joshua seem somewhat similar, somewhat the same of what the people had faced historically? Hmm? Raise your hand if you can encounter Joshua and you hearken back to Exodus. Now, I, I know all, not all of us spent a whole heck of a lot of time in Scripture. Maybe last week and the previous week was the first time you heard of anything happening with the people in Exodus. But it sounds strangely similar to what people had experienced in the past at the Red Sea. And I can't help but to think that even though it was a new generation of people, remember, it wasn't a day and a night before, but, when, but between when, when, when Israel experienced freedom from the exodus and made their way in process to the promise, what should have taken 40 days in scriptural history took 40 years because of the people's disobedience. And now they're getting ready to cross into the promise and it's a new generation of people. Who, who, who didn't know what God did in the past. And I can't help but to think that perhaps they had conversation and dialogue with people who had stuck around long enough from previous generations and survived and sustained through time to say, this isn't anything new. Crossing here isn't anything new. The craziness of the current isn't, isn't anything new. We, we, we've seen, we've heard stories of how it was that God sustained the people then. And on the basis of the evidence that we can speak of, you could have confidence to take the next step. And, 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 I, and I studied this week, and I don't know what this might mean for you or your present circumstance. I don't think it's any mistake that you're here receiving this word now or online. But there seems to be a relationship that exists between evidence and confidence. Evidence of yesterday and confidence for today. It seems that evidence of God's movement through time runs hand in hand with your confidence to move now. There, there, there seems to be an interplay, a relationship that exists between evidence and confidence. Yesterday's evidence bursts confidence for today. And the only reason I think that they were able to step foot in the way they stepped foot with confidence it's God's children was because they hearkened back to the evidence of God's movement yesterday. And you know, brothers and sisters, in a life of faith, the confidence that you have runs in proportion to the evidence that you collect. And you might say to yourself, well, pastor, that seems easy. If there's a relationship between my confidence for today and the evidence of God's movement through time, history, then, that, then, then my next step is easy. I'll just wait for the evidence of God so that I can build the confidence to take the next step. You know, I, d depending on what you're going through, I'll just wait on the evidence of God and on the basis of the evidence, then I'll have the confidence to take the next step. But, but, but the word reminds us that, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Ooh, that, that, that makes things a bit challenging for me. Translation Church, that's the challenge of faith. The, the, the evidence of God always seems to come after the fact. The evidence of God always seems to come as a byproduct of someone's confidence to move, absent immediate evidence. The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. What does that mean for us? 
that as we flip the pages of Scripture, it seems that, that the evidence of God's movement or the evidence of God's presence always seems to come after the fact. It seems to come retrospectively. I want to run us through a quiz. This is an interactive segment of, 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 of the message. I'm going to give you some scenarios, and I need your answer. Anybody remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, from, from, from the book of Daniel and, 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 and the fiery furnace? Raise your hand if you're familiar with old Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys were renamed uh, in, in accordance to the king. In their defeat, they had stripped their identities and their names and were given new names. That, that was their Babylonian name and not their Israelite name. But, but let, me, let me ask you a question. Just to kind of prove my point here, evidence and confidence. Did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego evidence the presence of God before or after they were forced into the fiery furnace? The answer is after. After they were forced into the fire. After they were forced into the furnace. Take a note from Noah. Noah built the ark. Noah built a boat with no evidence of rain. All he had was the confidence of faith that the promises of God would be sure in the presence of no evidence. D did Mary, the mother of Jesus, evidence the presence of the Lord before or after she said yes in a mess and the angel departed? And the answer is after. After she said yes, and after the angel went away, and after things started to fall apart, that she evidenced the movement of the Lord, the movement of the gospel in her gut. It took place after the fact. The evidence came after the fact. Did Mary Magdalene evidence the presence of the Lord before or after she shed tears at the tomb of Jesus and the others went home? The answer is after. After. The evidence of God always seems to come after the fact to the extent that you can stick around long enough in faith. And the problem with us, brothers and sisters, is that oftentimes we'll, we'll feel the flames getting hotter and the floodwaters growing higher and the stone will be rolled in front of the tomb and Friday will bleed into Saturday and Saturday will bleed into Sunday and, 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 and our impatience will prompt us to declare a premature verdict of God on the basis of insufficient evidence. But I believe this word was meant to go to someone in the gap. Someone in the gap between then and now, between your past and what God's about to do. I believe this word was meant to go to someone in the gap to say, don't lose your confidence in God because you have no evidence to go on. Because this word reminds us that sometimes you've got to get up while it's still dark, Mary. And sometimes you've got to walk around in your slicker while it's still sunny, Noah. And sometimes you've got to refuse to bow in the, in the presence of pressure, Shadrach. Because there are some things about God that you just won't get unless you go through. Amen? There's just some things about God that you just won't get unless you choose in faith to go through. And I venture to think, brothers and sisters, the reason why we never grow in God, the reason why our faith is oftentimes left in infancy is because we refuse to go through anything that's challenging. We refuse to go through and trust. And we jump ship prematurely, making a premature verdict on God on the basis of what we feel is insufficient evidence, but the evidence always seems to come after confidence. God will ask us to build enough confidence to step, and then the evidence will come. Brothers and sisters, stranger or friend joining us online, don't let the evidence of the gap ruin your confidence in God. We must consistently strive to find the courage to keep crossing. We must to be a people who will cross against the current, to be a people who walk against the grain, to, to be a people whose movement run counter 
to what you see in the current. We must fight for the courage to be a people who consistently strive to take the next step. And if you're scared right now, just take a step. If you're uncertain right now, brother or sister online, just take a step. If you're unsure or your resources are scarce, just take a step. If, if, if your chances are slim, just, just take a step. If you don't know where the strength is going to come from for the next breath or the next moment, just take a step. No matter what the diagnosis declares, just, just take a step. If the odds are stacked against you, just, just take a step. God's not asking that you take care of things in one felt swoop. God's just asking you to take the next step. Just find the faith. To do it. It might be inconvenient for you right now. It might be inconvenient, but scripture reminds us that God has a history of taking what feels inconvenient right now and doing the incredible. For those who will just find the faith and fortitude to walk, don't bow out at the banks. You're so close. Don't bow out at the banks right now. Church, look at this. They didn't know that the next step would signal the water stopping. They didn't know the current was crazy. And all they could see what was happening in the current. And they had no idea that a step with the confidence of faith would evidence God. They had no idea that their next step would signal the water stop. Neither do we. Neither do we. And I can't help but to think... That the only reason, brothers and sisters in the balcony, brothers and sisters right here, brothers and sisters joining us online, in state or afar, the only reason that generation had enough confidence to cross today was because they were raised by people who had enough evidence of God yesterday. They were raised by a generation of people to say, it's scary, it's confusing. You might, know not, what the, you might not know what the next step is going to cause for you, but I have enough evidence of God in my history to tell you that you should have confidence right now. It's going to be crazy. You might be fearful, but just take a step. God's given us grace for the gap of yesterday, and I assume, I have trust that for this gap, God will show up again. It was the evidence from others that gave the next generation the confidence of faith. Can't you see them stepping and saying, if God made a way where there was no way back when, then surely God will keep me in these swift moving waters now if I just keep on walking. If God afforded enough grace for the gap of yesterday, then surely God will grant me the same measure of grace for the gap that I face again. Again, grace for the gaps. Again, I look back and I see how far God's brought us and God's asking us to take a step in faith again. And the next movement of faith draws us closer to God, which gives us more confidence and we see more evidence and the evidence breeds more confidence. Evidence and confidence go hand in hand, but the evidence always comes after. Grace for the gaps. Again, God, give us more grace for the gaps again. This, this first gap in the Red Sea wasn't the last gap, and we had enough grace to go through that gap, and I only have to believe that for this gap, you'll give us the grace to do it again. We look back on certain sections of life and see that they were training for this season of life. And that's one of my last notes. That's one of my last notes. That I'm going to leave you with before we surround ourselves at this table. That, that, that feudal, feudal sections of life can be setups for fertile seasons of life. What feel like feudal sections of your life right now might be a setup for more fruitful seasons that you just can't see. Let's harken back to some of this word. To give us confidence to take the next steps so we can see the next evidence of God. Don't you remember? Huh? That, that, that Moses was raised a Hebrew of Hebrews. 
but, but, but was pulled out of the water by Pharaoh's daughter. And from that point, since she pulled him out of the water, she says, I'm going to raise him as my own in Egyptian royalty. And he grew up with Egyptian language and Egyptian ways. But he learned enough as he grew older that he wasn't Egyptian, that in fact he was a Hebrew. That was his identity. That's what those were his roots. And one day as he was overlooking the work of the Egyptian, uh, Egyptian taskmaster and the Egyptian taskmaster was whipping the Hebrew, he was enraged. And what happened? He killed the Egyptian slave master, and the other saw and says, you're going to do the same thing to us? In Egypt, there was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so he escaped, and he lived the rest of his adult life in the desert. Now, don't you think that he may have looked back on that time and said it was a futile, sections of, it was a futile section of life? All that time may have felt like a waste as a shepherd for his uncle Jethro or his father-in-law Jethro. And he came upon the burning bush in the desert in that feudal section of life. And he learned ultimately that that feudal section of life was a setup for a fertile season. Because God would need a deliverer to lead a freed nation from oppression through the desert. And who better to lead someone to the promise than one who had been through the desert. See, he didn't know it at the time. But that, that, that feudal section of life that he thought he was a failure, that feudal, that feudal section of life was a training ground for a fertile season. And it didn't have as much to do with what God was teaching him then, but what God was setting him up to see later. Futility and fertility. Futility and fertility. fertility. And to the extent that we have the, the, the patience and the faith to walk in what seemed like feudal times is your setup for a fertile season. Huh? Doesn't that make sense? We got to live into it. We got to walk into it. Moses was the, wasn't the only one, but look at David. He was a run shepherd boy that was tasked with the with the with the less than favorable job of, of herding sheep in the in the pasture, shoveling sheep dung. And as the run, the youngest, all he knew was the isolation of the pasture. But it was a setup. That 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 feudal section of life was a setup for a fruitful season, a fertile season, because it was then when he left the pasture and he learned that the nation was at war and nobody was going to fight Goliath, that the right shepherd boy that came from the pasture went into the battlefield and looked at everybody shaking in their boots and he looked at Saul and says, no one's going to fight him. Who is this guy speaking blasphemies about the God that I worship, the God who sustained me in the pasture? I'll fight him. And Saul says, you're crazy. You're just a kid. You can't even wear armor. It's too unwieldy. And, J and David says, it's just too much for me. All I need is what God's given me. And in that moment, as Saul's question, you can't do this, David says this. He says, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear Back then, in what seemed to be a futile section of life, has trained me for this fertile season. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, back there in that gap, has given me the grace that I need for this gap, and it will save me from the hand of this Philistine. You see, he was able to evidence the way God moved for him then, and it was a setup for the confidence that he had then. And now, and because of a futile section of life that he was able to live through and trust God through, it set him up for a fruitful season. He couldn't have conceived it at the time, but David came to discover that the section of his life that, he didn't, make, that didn't make sense was only a training ground for a season of life where everything would. Are we not in a phase of life that feels futile? Hmm? I, now, I, I know most of us aren't accustomed to, 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 to saying amen or shouting in worship, but maybe at your computer screen, and maybe you're here, and, and maybe you've gone to bed professionally, vocationally, socially, mentally, spiritually, maybe you've gone to bed convinced that you're in a futile season, that you're in a futile section. How many, because of the racial tension and because of the political tension, voting, voting comes Tuesday, 
We're on, the, we're on the cusp of a major election. And how many of us, over the past seven months, in the middle of a pandemic, in political tension, in social tension, in financial tension, in vocational tension, have gone to bed convinced this was a futile section of life? But God says, have the confidence to take the next step in what seems like futility because it's only a setup for something else that you can't see or make sense of. And I know this section of life you don't understand and everything falling, uh, everything's falling apart, but you'll come to discover another season of life where it's going to make sense. Just walk with me. Just walk with me. And so we see in the Exodus, in the Exodus, this is where I need you to participate. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into... Now, I know that there are people that are convinced that there are people here. And I need you to do better than that. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into... And the waters were divided. And the Israelites went into the sea on... Oh... That, 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 that seemed to that point to be a rather futile section of life. But God used that to set them up for what would be a, a, a fertile season. And the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. That was an exodus. And now we go all the way, fast forward 40 years in time to Joshua. And, 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 that, and in, that, in the scriptures it says the people crossed over opposite Jericho while all Israel were crossing over on the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood on, and what's the next one? In the middle of the Jordan, until the entire nation finished crossing over. The lesson God taught them wasn't just profitable for that section of life in the Exodus. They didn't know it, but it was a deposit or a down payment that they would need to experience the next season. And oftentimes, we'll skip out on the futile sections of life and we won't stick around for the fruit. I don't know what that means for you. But maybe the Holy Spirit moving inside of you is asking you just to stick around a little longer before you're convinced that God's moving without evidence. To have confidence to walk long enough and the evidence will come to bear in the fullness of time. So get this as I close. The waters floods its banks in the harvest. And that was just the time God was asking the people to move. It wasn't the most favorable time to walk. It wasn't the most favorable time to cross. It wasn't the most favorable time to set foot in the waters because the Jordan floods its banks in the harvest. But the instruction of God was that the priests would pass through first. Why? Because they were the carriers of the covenant. They were the carriers of the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant was a physical sign of an invisible presence. It was a physical, a, a visible sign of an invisible grace that reminded them in the gap that there is no gap so wide that God's grace can't feel, that God's grace can't fill. And God's grace in the gap is able to turn something that in the time feels futile into something fertile, ultimately. It feels futile immediately, but by God's grace in the gap, becomes fruitful ultimately. Friends, that's why it's so important to stay the course even when it feels confusing because you don't know what your movement in this scene means to affect other movements in the movie. They had no idea how their faithfulness to God at the sea set them up for their movement across the Jordan now. We're in a gap between where we were and where we will be. And we're asking God for a measure of grace to move in a way against the current so that our movement in this scene right now might be a setup for something significant later on in the movie. 
May it be so. I want to end it with a story. This story comes from Barb Pico, and she's given me permission to share it. You know, I passed out the gift cards the other week, the previous weeks, Walmart and Kroger. Barb came into my office last week, and she said, Jake, I want to tell you something. I was in St. Clairsville. I never really shop in St. Clairsville. But I was in St. Clairsville, and I made a decision to stop at Walmart. And, and, and then after I stopped at Walmart, I went to Kroger. Is that true, Barb? I, I went to Kroger, and I did some shopping, and I ended, ended up seeing a bin of, of very, very significantly discounted diapers. And, and I thought, oh, well, how convenient. And, and so she dug through the bin and got as many diapers, cartons of diapers as she could be shit because she says the house of the carpenter utilizes those. I was just going to buy all these discounted diapers and, and, and use them to donate to the house of the carpenter for a later, for a later use. And she was getting some uh, cooking utensils. Uh, and, and after she got some cooking, were they baking sheets or something like that? She got some baking sheets and she got the diapers and she checked out and she said, I left Kroger, uh, Kroger, Kroger grocery store and I was in the parking lot and it occurred to me, you know what, somebody in my family would like, might like to have some of the similar cooking sheets. Um, I'm going to go back in and get some cooking sheets for the extended family member. And as she went back into the store, she tells me, I, I, I went back in and I saw two other women by the same bargain bin digging for diapers. And it was at that point the Spirit prompted me to stop. And I overheard them saying that, that, that they had to wait to buy the discounted diapers, otherwise they couldn't afford them at the regular price. Whew. Look at how the movement of God works for the people that attune their hearts and their attention to being purveyors of grace. Before she went and got the baking utensils, she stopped and she, she looked at the women and said, how many diapers do you need? And she helped them dig out the diapers from the bargain bin and, and, and gave them the diapers that they needed. They said, thank you. And she says, ma'am, I have something for you. And she got into her purse and she pulled out the gift card. And she says, I give this to you in the name of Christ Jesus as a gift for the glory of God. And she said, Jake, she said, Pastor Jake, she started to cry before she could say thank you. What did Barb Pico behold? Raise your hand, Barb, for those who don't know. What did Barb Pico behold but a glimpse? A glimpse of God's glory and the weight of grace for someone in a gap. The weight of grace that met somebody in a gap. In our prayer, in our petition, in us, through us and for us, our petition is, God, give me grace. Give me grace for the gaps again and again and again. Give me a measure of grace for the gap that I face, not just my gap, for, for the gaps of the others. Give me a measure of grace. Do it again. Do it again. May we leave this place confident to cross no matter where you are and who you are, understanding that what we're about to partake of is a visible sign of an invisible grace for the gaps that you face again and again and again. That's why we have to keep coming back and back to this table for the grace that we need for the gaps that we face. May it be so. In Jesus' name, and all of us said loud and clear, The Ark of the Covenant that the priest carried. Notice it wasn't Joshua who went first as Moses did. It was the priest did because they carried the presence of God. And as they carried the Ark of the Covenant, they stepped their feet into, swift, into the swift moving waters of the Jordan. And when they did, their next movement signals the waters stopping. And the people walked on dry ground past the sign of God's presence. And they understood that there's nowhere we can go where God's grace can't fill our gaps. And in the same way, the same way, Jesus, who was the physical, in the flesh, incarnate representation of God, 
the fulfillment of the law and the prophets sat with his disciples in a gap in between where they were and what would happen. And he knew that in that gap, he needed to provide them and us something to hold on to, to remember, so that we could take the next step. And so it was, he sat at the table with his disciples, celebrating a Seder, celebrating a Passover. And so get this, every year they sat down and they celebrated the Passover because if God did it for our ancestors in the gap, maybe as we eat the unleavened bread and we take the cup which symbolizes the unleavened bread that they ate at the Passover before the Exodus, that they ate in hopes that God would deliver them from oppression and they spread the blood of the lamb on their doors as an outward sign that they wanted liberated and freed, Ever since then, through time, over the gaps, they ate again to say, maybe if God did it then, God will do it again. And we hold on to the outward signs of God's presence that liberated my ancestors. Maybe this will be the time that God would do it for Rome and us. So it was that Jesus took that same bread that they celebrated as evidence of God's movement to provide them the confidence that God would do it again. And in a fertile section of life that maybe God would set them up for a fruitful season. And they ate and they partook and they drank. And Jesus took those signs that they held on to in the past. And he says, I want you to take and eat of this in remembrance of what God did for you yesterday, in anticipation and hope of what God will do tomorrow, today, today, today for the gaps that you face, because you're just not gonna consume it in remembrance of what God did. I want you to consume it in remembrance of what I'll do and what I'm doing. You can't see it yet. You can't understand it. But for a section of life you can't understand, I want to set you up for a fruitful season that you will. So it was that he took the bread, and after breaking it and giving thanks, he said, take and eat of this, all of you. This is my body, broken for you. Every time you sup and every time you eat bread, do it in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the supper was over, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, gave it to them and said, Take and drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of of me. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, Holy Spirit, for those of us joining here and in our homes, in this house of God and in another house of God, we can call it such because we're bent on consuming you here in there and wherever we go to the extent that we're consumed with being mere reflections of your grace we are the tabernacles of the living God and so we ask Holy Spirit that you fall in these gifts of bread and juice that they become for us spiritually your body and your blood so that in so consuming we're consumed with being the body of Christ glimpses of grace for a world and a gap have your way, great God, that you are over these gifts and over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us take, eat, and be thankful. And I don't know.
But I'm trying to be pro- I'm just trying to be responsive or faithful to a prompt that I feel of God. If you need this altar, if you need this prayer rail for any reason, obviously don't pass in front of the person beside you, but cross out your nearest exit. And if you want to come up here and spend some time in prayer, this altar is open as it is always open for you. I want to create a space as we go into prayer for anybody that needs to have a conversation with their Lord. You know, pe- people, people lost their minds last night in this county because trick-or-treat was canceled. And I understand it. I have my own children. My son shed tears. But you know what? I wish we and the rest of the world would lose our minds over something else that got canceled. And that was the weight of our guilt. And that was the weight of our sin. And that was the weight of the shame that we bear on the cross of a crucified and again risen Christ. Of all the things that get canceled in this world, I wish that we would be mere reflections or billboard displays of the greatest thing that got canceled, which was a weight that we could not bear on our own. And in so consuming the sign, brothers and sisters, we become tangible signs for the rest of the world who pray for grace in the gaps. So I want to create a space where we can spend some time in silent prayer. If you feel the need where you are to come up and to spend some time in conversation with your Lord, please don't hesitate. Just show respect to your brother or your sister sitting beside you uh, and, and, and make sure that if there are people here uh, that, that you don't butt up right against them, that you show uh, some deference to, to space and the measures we're taking to stay safe. So brothers and sisters, let us spend some time in private prayer before we go in prayer and close out our time. Holy God, we are humbled in your presence. And we're thankful this day for the gift of the grace that you've afforded us. Because we're a people who find ourselves in another gap. A a, a gap between how life was and how life will be. And the craziness of our current causes us sometimes to lose confidence that there's a promise on the other side. But it's because of the sign of your presence, as it was for the Ark of the Covenant, that we can pass through less than favorable situations, understanding that there's no gap so wide that your grace can't fill. And you saw it fit, Almighty God, good God that you are, Lord of all, to provide us with a tangible visible sign of an inward and invisible grace of this table and your body and your blood and this bread in the cup that we consume to be tangible signs of grace for those in a gap 
And Lord, I don't know what we've experienced in our life or the week. But I ask in this time, Lord, that you fill us in only ways that you can. That you open our eyes individually. That you speak to our hearts so we know unmistakably it was you talking to us. And it wasn't just the feeble, of, the feeble attempts of a pastor to deliver a sermon. But to understand, Almighty God, that you've given us grace for the gap again. And you'll continue to do so to the extent that we have the confidence to trust you even in the presence where we feel there is no evidence. So God, have your way over us. Lord, we pray for all of those in the world around us. We find ourselves as United Methodist people, as a global community, praying for all of those who were devastated by forest fires and floodings from hurricane waters. For those who face persecution in the east, For those of us who find ourselves tense because of our professions and the uncertainty there. For those of us who find ourselves tense and not confident because of the political tensions that we've viewed and have been a part of. For our broken hearts of how divided we are as a people. We ask that this table, this bread and cup, Transform us to being who you've called us to be. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in this community, in this state, and around the world. For those near to us, for Nancy Coons, as she gives thanks for all the brothers and sisters that have sent support and cards and signs of encouragement and wisdom, for the treatment that's had to be paused for her diagnosis because they now have to check on a mass that's on her lung for the gap that she's in Lord give her the grace that she needs for Sharon Wiesner and her continued re recuperation and recovery for the strength that she needs to be the witness that you've called her to be for Brother Harold as he attends to her for our neighbors in the hospital who are recovering for our families among us devastated by loss and grief and Lord we name specifically Betsy Taggart and Stephanie and the rest of the family is they mourn the passing of Jack. For all those struggling with COVID, recovering from COVID and fear that they're going to spread it to their family members and friends. Steady the hands of our professionals, Lord, our teams of nurses and doctors that serve on the front lines day in and day out to test and to examine and to bring about restoration and healing as they know that their work on a daily basis is their witness of your healing hand. Lord, we pray for those recovering from surgery. Lord, we give you thanks for uh, the gift of these altar flowers as their visible reminders of those faithful servants who comprise our king unit, our women's unit, one of two units in this church, those present and those who have gone before and touched our hearts with memories. Lord, we ask that you guide us and shape us and mold us and form us to be the people that you've called us to be with confidence that might be able to meet somebody else in the current and give them grace for the gap that they face. So, Lord, empower us to be a people who leave this place, to be who you've called us to be, and that's living signs of this table. In Jesus' name, we pray in the only name you've given us in heaven, and we pray with confidence as your children, in the name of Christ Jesus, praying as he's taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you'll stand for our ascending forth. I'm going to throw a, a curveball at Bob in the balcony. Uh, Bob, if you can locate uh, the, the, the verse from um, Amazing Grace, uh, I, want to, I want to use that as... The, the platform that we'll use for our sending forth. We all know
the familiar, the, familiar, the familiar hymn, Amazing Grace. Look at this verse. I want you to say it with me. Uh, the highlighted section is, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have... He's given us grace for that gap. Tis grace that brought me safe in the present, and grace will lead me. There's still work to do. There's still some steps we need to take. May we take them faithfully, understanding there's no gap so wide that God's grace don't go. And we, as ones who walk, will be the signs for others as the glimpse of grace that has afforded them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.